Hey, and welcome back to Kelly's Take Two pre-licensing Zoom review. So glad to have you with me this afternoon or evening, whatever it is that you're watching this review. Today, we are going to dive into Unit 10 out of the Dearborn 10th edition pre-licensing manual. We're going to be talking all about the sales contract today. A little introduction here. We're going to let you know and remind you that the purpose of a sales contract is that it's a legally binding document that sets forth the terms and conditions that the two parties are willing to be under contract for. Using a standardized form, kind of like the offer to purchase form 2T, which is a sales contract put together or created through a partnership between the North Carolina Association of Realtors and the North Carolina Bar Association. Be sure to remember that the Real Estate Commission does not create contract forms for use. As a matter of fact, the only way you can access the North Carolina Association of Realtor forms is by joining your local board. You will have access to those documents along with hundreds of other pre-printed forms for your use. If you choose to remain a real estate agent without joining your local board, and you need some type of a contract form, the Real Estate Commission is advising that you go speak with an attorney to help have those documents uh, drawn up. We as real estate agents are forbidden from writing any kind of contract language. Additionally, crossing any kind of contract language out in a pre-printed form. That would be considered practicing law. And guess what? That's against the law. Yep, you guessed it. Okay. But on that same note, if a buyer and a seller are, which they would be a direct party to the contract, they are permitted to draft contract language or cross things out. Now, as their representative, as their agent, would we advise them to seek an attorney's opinion before doing such a thing? Yes, absolutely. But a direct party, as a general rule, a direct party to a contract may draft contract language, which includes crossing things out. But a real estate agent who is not a direct party to the contract may not do so. Are there times when a real estate agent is a direct party to a contract? Of course. When would that happen? Well, if an, a real estate broker is selling their own home, they would be a direct party to the contract. Or if they're buying property for themselves, they're going to be a direct party to the contract. Another time would be as when you are hired. So when you are signing an employment contract uh, from in terms of a listing contract with a seller or a buyer agency agreement, if you're working with the buyer, you again would be a direct party to the contract. Just to be clear about that. All right, we are only allowed to do what? Fill in the blanks. Of course, unless we're a direct party to the contract. Very good. We are expected to know when and what forms to use when it comes to working with our buyers and our sellers, which means what? The real estate standard form, which is what you're going to be tested on, it's the offer to purchase form 2T. It's the standard form that realtors use. So it's the one you're going to be tested on. It is primarily used for residential properties and vacant land. There are many other contract forms that you can use for other situations like commercial properties or new construction properties, those sorts of things. So be aware of that. In North Carolina, if you're working with a buyer from another state, they may not appreciate how our standard contract form is worded or organized or some such thing. Why do I say that? Because every state pretty much has a different type of sales contract that realtors will utilize. For instance, I had a student one time in a post-licensing class and we were going through the offer to purchase standard form 2T. And let me tell y'all, she did not like it. Every other word was, I wouldn't let my client sign that, or I would cross that out, or I would do this. And I said, mm -mm, no, you will not, because that would be practicing law, which is what? Against the law, 
against the law, so you don't want to do that. But do understand that if you are working with a buyer or a seller and they, mm, they just don't like that standard form, they don't have to use it. They don't have to use it. They can go and speak with an attorney and have an attorney create one on their behalf. As long as, here we go, as long as whatever contract they create, the attorney, it contains 19 basic provisions. Now, you don't need to know all of the 19 provisions for the exam, but by rule, 19 need to be there. Some of them are really kind of like, no, duh, seriously, what? We got to put people's names on there? You're kidding me, what a shocker. Or we have to put in the contract price? No, Carol, you don't say. Or we have to name the escrow agent, the agent who's going to hold the, the trust money. Seriously? Yes, I know. Okay, so a lot of it is kind of common sense. All right, here we go. Let's keep going. So you have to have 19 things that are part of the contract, but there are two items that will never, ever be part of the contract. And that would include any mention of broker compensation or any disclaimer of liability by the broker. Very good. Let's keep going. Okay. Now that we've gone over the basic introduction to the offer to purchase standard form 2T, we are gonna actually look at the contract form together. So you can follow along with me. I'm gonna share my screen in a second. Or if you would like, if you have a copy of the offer to purchase form 2T, feel free to bring that out and kind of follow along with me. We're gonna go through the contract form pretty much line by line. I'm gonna slow down uh, when we hit sections that are very important and have come up on like every single practice test I've taken. And then we're actually given permission by the real estate commission to kind of whoop, uh, speed up during certain parts as well, which is a great relief because this thing is how long? 15 pages, 15 pages. Why Kelly is it so long? Because it's full of definitions and directives, full of definitions and directives. The contract form used to be one page front and back. That was it, y'all. Now it's 15 pages. Wow, that's amazing. All right, so let me go ahead and get ready to share my screen with you. I am actually going to skip to something new, which is exciting. The offer to purchase Form 2T was recently updated and they, meaning the North Carolina Association of Realtors in partnership with the North Carolina Bar Association have changed a few things. So you should hopefully have the most updated contract form, which would be July, 2021. You don't wanna use old forms because using old forms is also considered practicing law, which is what against the law. So you wanna avoid that at all costs. But they added this number 23, which I absolutely adore. And it tells us what is what are the remedies if the buyer or the seller breaches the contract. Now remember, for under contract, breach means somebody is breaking the contract, but the terminology is breach. You break it, you breach it. Not you break it, you buy it. Does it okay? Never mind. All right, let's go in here. So here we are, let's see if I can highlight this. It tells us what are our remedies. And right here, I would take notes on this y'all, right now I would to write this down. What if the buyer breaks or breaches the contract? I'm gonna read it literally out loud to you because it's important to know what the language is saying and then we'll tackle any vocabulary that seems out of reach. So here we go. In the event of a material breach, okay, first of all, what does material mean? Big time, big time, that's what it means. Like big time breach, significant, serious, big time breach. In the event of a material breach of this contract by buyer, seller shall, okay, here we go. So here's the remedy, I need a remedy. All right, Black Crows, let's go. All right, so in the event of a material breach of this contract by the buyer, the seller shall be entitled to, get ready, any earnest money deposit. 
the payment of any earnest money deposit and any due diligence fee to the seller without regard of their respective amounts, including zero, together shall serve as important, write this down or highlight it, liquidated damages and as seller sole and exclusive remedy for such breach. And I'm gonna pause right there. That means essentially if the buyer breaches the contract, the seller is only entitled to keep the due diligence fee and the earnest money deposit, period. The seller cannot sue the buyer, nothing. That is it. Now it goes on to say, without limiting the seller's rights under paragraph 4E and 4F for damage to the property, that's insignificant to what we're discussing right this minute about what happens to the money, the earnest money deposit and the due diligence fee. All right, so we're gonna ignore that paragraphs 4E and 4F for a minute. We'll hit those later. Now let's keep going. It is acknowledged by the parties that the amount of the liquidated damages is compensatory and not punitive, such amount being a reasonable estimation of the actual loss that seller would incur as a result of a breach of this contract by the buyer. All right, so we're just saying, hey, we're agreeing. It's hard to kind of estimate what our, what our, what the damages would be if the buyer breaches, but we're willing to be like, okay, we're sticking with the earnest money deposit and the due diligence fee as liquidated damages. And that term is spelled out right there in the body of this contract. I'm gonna go back in. The payment to seller of the liquidated damages, see that term is used a lot of times, it's important, of the liquidated damages shall not con constitute a penalty or forfeiture but actual compensation for seller's anticipated loss. Both parties acknowledging the difficulty determining seller's actual damages for such breach. That's all the seller gets. So when you are meeting with a seller on a listing presentation, you need to help the seller understand that that is the case, that they will not be able to sue the buyer for extra damages or so on and so forth. Now, Let's talk about this part about the due diligence fee without regard to their respective amounts, including zero. I get this question a lot. Kelly, tell us about this due diligence fee. First of all, what the heck is due diligence? Well, when we go back into the body of the contract, we're going to read the definition of due diligence coming up. Due diligence is fairly unique to North Carolina. There are a few other states that practice this as well in residential um, sales, but it's pretty unique to North Carolina. The due diligence fee is paid directly from the buyer to the seller. Like the check is cut to the seller. It goes right in the seller's bank account. The seller can take that money and do what with it? Anything they want. Wait, go, go shoe shopping? Yes. Go to Harris? Yes. Do what, go, to, go to Carowinds? Do what you want. Do what you want with that money. All right. That due diligence fee, if the buyer moves forward with the transaction and closes on the transaction, that due diligence fee will be a credit to the buyer and a debit to the seller. What'd you say, Cal? At closing, the due diligence fee is a credit to the buyer and a debit to the seller. Now, how much is a usual due diligence fee? I get this question a lot. The answer is there is no such thing. The due diligence fee tends to be market driven. So in a buyer's market, like we had after the great recession, when we had all kinds of inventory, the due diligence fee was frequently zero. That's a laugh right now, isn't it? That is hilarious because now in this hot, hot, hot seller's market, due diligence fees are upwards of 50,000. I've heard of them going as high as 100,000. Right. So it's really, uh, amazing. We'll say it that way. Okay. So again, the due diligence fee can be zero because it's market driven. All right. We're going to get back to that as well when we get to the part of the contract regarding the due diligence fee and so on and so forth. But let's go back in here and talk about, well, what happens? We talked about if the buyer breaches, but what if the seller breaches the contract? Look at this. Here we go. In the event of material breach of this contract by seller, 
If buyer elects to terminate this contract as a result of such breach, buyer shall be entitled to return of, okay, here we go. Now ready? So if the seller breaches, the buyer will have returned to him, her, or they, the earnest money deposit and the due diligence fee together with the reasonable costs actually incurred by buyer in connection with buyer's due diligence. Think of the buyer's due diligence timeframe as an inspection period. So the buyer's gonna hire, let's see if we could add this up. The buyer might hire um, a home inspector and do a home inspection rate right on and pass. That's gonna be a good 500. They are probably gonna have the appraisal already ordered and paid for, we'll call that 500. They might get a survey done, that's good 800. They may pay for um, an HVAC system kind of inspection, that's gonna be 250. They may have already hired the attorney to do the title research, that's another, we'll call that 300. So that I'm at 2,350 bucks right there. All right, so it says right here in the contract that the buyer, if the seller breaches, if the seller breaks the contract, the buyer has the earnest money deposit return, the due diligence fee returned, and they should also be reimbursed for all the money they spent on inspections during the due diligence period. It goes on to say this, this provision shall not affect any other remedies available to the buyer. Like what? Okay, scratch your head and think about this. You know, you know what the other biggie is. What's the other biggie? If the seller refuses to sell the property, the buyer can sue for what? Shout it out. What? Specific performance. So the buyer has the right to go back to court and sue the seller for specific performance. What does that really mean? That means the buyer is saying, hey, seller, I want you to do specifically what the contract says. And specifically, it says you are to sell me your house. I don't want your money. I don't want your jewelry. I want your house. So specific performance is what the buyer may sue for. All right, very good. And additionally, just a little side note, they could try perhaps to sue for consequential damages, which would be things like pain and suffering, um, pretty rare, but they could, you know, could give it a shot. All right, now let's see how we handle legal fees. So if we all get in a fight, the buyer and the seller, they're arguing what's gonna happen, who's gonna pay the legal fees? Well, if I'm not wrong, and we will read this out loud, but if I'm not wrong, pretty much it'll say, if you are the loser, you pay the winner's attorney and legal fees. But let's read it together. Attorney fees. If legal proceedings are brought by buyer or seller against the other to collect the earnest money deposit, due diligence fee, or due diligence costs, the parties agree that the party shall be entitled to recover reasonable attorney's fees to the extent permitted under North Carolina General Statute 6-21.2. The parties acknowledge and agree that the terms of this contract with respect to entitlement to the earnest money deposit, due diligence fee, or due diligence costs each constitute an quote unquote evidence of indebtedness pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 6-21.2. Okay. And then we have a note box down here, which screams what? Pay attention to what it says in the note box. Okay, let's read what it says. Note, a party seeking recovery of attorney's fees under North Carolina General Statute 6-21.2 must first give written notice to the other party that they have five days from the mailing of the notice to pay the outstanding amount without attorney's fees. So this is great. This gives you a total guideline of what to do when someone breaches the contract and how those legal proceedings are to be handled, what the rules are. And of course, we could go back into that general statute 6-21.2 um, at your leisure or, or whatnot. 
All right, give me just one second and we will dive in to the beginning of standard form offer to purchase form 2T. All right, and welcome back. Let's go ahead and start from where, where we love to start from the beginning. Here in front of you, as soon as I share my screen, will be an image of the most recent North Carolina offer to purchase and contract form 2T. Now what you see in front of you is called the guidelines form and we are going to be reading the directives and so forth as we go through the form. Again, I'm going to slow down when I get to areas that are highly testable and very, very important and I'll speed up over items that are less so, like right here. So remember from a minute ago, I said that the North Carolina Real Estate Commission has a rule, part of license law that says that an offer to purchase and contract needs to contain 19 items. Well, one of the 19 items is simply to say, who is the seller, who is the buyer, and then let's describe this property. And you might note some language from earlier in the book right here where it says, this property shall include all that real estate described below together with all appurtenances there too, including the improvements located thereon and the fixtures and personal property listed in paragraphs two and three below. So right there, you probably recognize that word appurtenant. Remember when you first heard it and thought that is a weird word, but here it is in the offer to purchase form 2T. Remember if something is appurtenant, it sticks to the property, not the person like fleas sticking to the dog or a Velcro suit a man in a Velcro suit stuck up against a wall in some art museum. I had one of my students do that one time. Crazy story. Okay, here we go. It says in this little area that if the property has a mobile home on it, that we might wanna consider using a, a, another form called additional provisions addendum. And on that form, it talks about manufactured homes, which used to be called mobile homes. All right, let's keep going. This is where we're gonna write in the basic street address, but as you learned in unit four, that's not enough. We need more information. I'm gonna come back to that note box in a second. More information is found here. We learned in unit four that you've gotta write down the uh, information about the plat map, meaning the lot and block, which is located right here, lot and block. And then in North Carolina, we're, we are really big on the deed book and page. So you're gonna be utilizing that as well. You will also put in the tax ID or PIN number of the property. You can find all of this using your county's GIS system, or you can go down, just haul yourself down to your local courthouse and look it all up. Well, we would go to the Register of Deeds office more than likely. All right, let's head back up here to this note box. And it says, which is interesting, note, governmental authority over taxes, zoning, school districts, utilities, and mail delivery may differ from the address shown, which is true. For instance, I own a home that's located in the town of Woodfin, which is just outside of Asheville, but it has an Asheville address. Why? Because Woodfin does not have a post office. So my property address is Asheville, even though my home very clearly is located in the town of Woodfin. All right, let's go over here and look at purchase price. So letter D is where, this is the part gets you real excited when you're writing up your first offer to purchase, oh my goodness. This is where you're going to write in how much your buyer is offering for the property. This is where you're going to write in what the due diligence fee is going to be and how it will be delivered. Will it be in cash, personal check, bank check, wire transfer, Venmo, who knows what. That's electronic transfer right here. All right, very good. Now it says that the due diligence fee is gonna be made payable and delivered to the seller by the effective date of the contract, which is defined coming up. So let's we'll wait for that. 
it actually is in here as a definition, how you figure out what is the effective date. All right, so we'll wait for that. This area is where the buyer, with the help of the real estate agent, writes down information about the earnest money deposit, how much is it going to be, and is it going to be in cash, personal check, bank check, electronic transfer, is it going to be delivered by the effective date of contract or will it be delivered a little bit later and a little bit later means within five days of the effective date of the contract that's five calendar days so if something is if a provision is referencing a deadline like five days right there if it doesn't say banking days or business days the default would be calendar days, just FYI, okay? Now, sometimes it's not so usual, but sometimes there might be additional earnest money that may arrive later. That's where you would address that. Now, the, the rest of this area, well, really to here, um, are less common, so I'm gonna quickly go over those. So if we are assuming the loan, how much do we owe on that? What's the unpaid principal balance. That's one option, very unusual, very unusual. Um, are we seller financing? Remember that's called a purchase money mortgage. We would address that there and include a seller financing addendum. Um, is this going to be regarding a building deposit of some sort? And if so, let's go ahead and attach the new construction addendum. And then last but not least, you gotta do some math and come up with the balance. And if math is not your jam, you're gonna find someone who is good at addition to go ahead and create that balance for you. Okay, let's read this area right here. If the parties agree that buyer will pay any fee or deposit described above by electronic transfer, seller agrees to cooperate in effecting such transfer, including the establishment of any necessary account and providing any necessary information to buyer, provided, however, buyer shall be responsible for additional costs, if any, associated with such transfer. Now, I know I just closed on a property personally not too long ago, and we did a wire transfer. And I think at my bank, it was like an $18 charge for that, which in the grand scheme of things is no big deal, but that's how it's addressed. All right, here we go. This area down here tells you that you are using the most current, current form. You want to make sure that you are using the most current form. It also tells us over here who has created this document. Remember I told you it was, um, the form is jointly approved by the North Carolina Bar Association and the North Carolina Association of Realtors. This area here is where your broker in charge will definitely want to see the buyer and seller's initials. However, it's gonna show up somewhere in the body of this document. It's important to note that if those initials are missing, that does not mean we do not have a valid contract, we do. The initials are simply there to acknowledge that the buyer and the seller have reviewed and understand the information on each page. All right, here we go. Now, what happens if the money doesn't show up when it's supposed to? Well, here we go, let's find out. Should buyer fail to deliver either the due diligence fee or any initial earnest money deposit by their due dates, or should any check or other funds paid by buyer be dishonored? That's such a kind way to say the check bounced. It bounced, y'all. Oh, okay. car is no good. Our money wasn't there, but it was dishonored. It was dishonored. All right, here we go. So any other funds paid by buyer were dishonored for any reason by the institution upon which the payment is drawn, Buyer shall have one, and I mean one, banking day after written notice or deliver, sorry, one banking day after written notice to deliver cash, official bank check, wire transfer, or electronic transfer to the payee. In the event buyer does not timely deliver the required funds, seller 
shall have the right to guess what? Terminate this contract upon written notice to buyer and seller shall be entitled to recover the due diligence fee together with all earnest money deposit paid or to be paid in the future. Wow. In addition, seller may be entitled to recover reasonable attorney fees and court costs. Oh my stars. See paragraph 23 for a party's right to attorney's fees incurred in collecting the earnest money deposit or due diligence fee. We're not playing about the money. We're not playing about the money. And we already went over paragraph 23. So that's a great reference point when it comes to breach of contract. Okay. Let's go down here. Let's talk about the earnest money deposit. It's a big deal. You will definitely receive, you will definitely hit some test questions that will want you to understand the difference between the earnest money deposit and the due diligence fee. So look alive, let's go. A earnest money deposit as defined, the initial earnest money deposit, the additional earnest money deposit and any other earnest monies paid or required to be paid in connection with this transaction, collectively called earnest money deposit shall be deposited promptly and held in escrow by escrow agent until closing. Now, interesting that it says promptly. There are rules about that. And in the part of your book called Appendix A, there's a whole section on trust money and how we're gonna handle trust monies. I wish I had that page memorized. I do not, but I will reference that for you. You wanna go back in Appendix A and review the rules regarding trust accounts. Okay, and how promptly you have to deposit trust account money. All right, here we go. Now it says, where did we leave off? Okay, okay, here we go. Until closing, at which the earnest money deposit, if it is the offer is not accepted, or if a condition of the contract is not met, not satisfied, then the earnest money deposit shall be refunded to the buyer. And again, it's referencing paragraph 23, which we already went over because it's so great to have that paragraph there that tells us exactly what's supposed to happen in the event that one of the parties breaches the contract. All right, let's keep going. Letter F, letter F reads, who is the escrow agent? Who is holding the trust money? Now, customarily, it is the listing firm, but it does not have to be the listing firm. Some firms will insist on holding the earnest money, even if they're representing the buyer. So just be aware of that. But customarily, it is the listing firm. Now, what if the listing firm does not have a trust account? Well, then they can't be the escrow agent. Oh, I know it's just brilliant, isn't it? They can't be the escrow agent. So then who will hold the trust money? The attorney that the buyer has hired will then be named as the escrow agent. Okay, let's read the note. This is important. I'm scrolling, pardon me. Okay, this is gonna tell us what happens if the buyer and the seller get in an argument about the earnest money deposit if there's a breach or so on and so forth. So let's read. It tells us what to do, which is so great. That's why this form is 15 pages long. Note, in the event of a dispute between seller and buyer over the disposition of the earnest money deposit, that means release, in the, rele the disbursement, the release of the earnest money deposit held in escrow, a licensed real estate broker is required by state law and an escrow agent, if not a broker, uh, to retain the earnest money deposit in the escrow agent's trust or escrow account until escrow agent has obtained a what? A written release from the parties consenting to its disposition or release or until disbursement is ordered by a court of competent jurisdiction. Alternatively, if a broker or an, or an attorney licensed to practice law in North Carolina is holding the earnest money deposit, the broker or attorney may 
deposit the disputed monies with the appropriate clerk of court in accordance with provisions, North Carolina General Statute 93A-12. Okay, so I can tell you now it's 90 days. So if we can't get the buyer and the seller to uh, agree to a written release of the money, then after 90 days, whoever's holding the money, the escrow agent can send that along to the clerk of court and the parties can go have this settled before judge. There you go. Now, this is interesting. I'm gonna tell you something that's not really in here, but is fascinating. Do you recall how we learned in unit seven that the buyer is the boss when it comes to um, informed consent for dual agency? And if we're missing that, then we look to what format for agency we have with the buyer and we follow suit because the buyer is the boss. Well, the same thing holds true when it comes to money, earnest money, deposits, due diligence fee. So what do I mean by that? Let's say, let's see if I can get my puppets out. Okay, I might, I might need my puppets. All right, let's say that um, Joe is the listing agent. Hi, Joe, he's a listing agent. Okay, and Claire is a buyer. All right, now Claire has a real estate agent. His name is Zach. So Zach is the buyer's agent. And Zach has gone ahead and hand delivered the due diligence fee and the earnest money deposit over to Joe's office. And he's dropped it off and got an acknowledgement that he did so and he went on his merry way. So it just happened. So this just the money, the checks just got dropped off. Well, now guess what? Who comes busting in the listing firm's door marching in here to go see Joe about these checks is the buyer, Claire. And she comes marching in there and says, give me my checks. And Joe says, but we're under contract. We've hit the effective date of contract. I don't care. I want my money back. Huh. What's Joe to do? Guess what? Joe is to give the money back to the buyer, back to Claire, and Claire and the seller will have to duke it out in court at a later date. So if the buyer busts into the listing firm's office demanding their checks back, that listing firm is required to do so, to give those back to the buyer. Buyer is the boss, all right. Oof. Very good. Can you imagine if that happened? Oh my goodness. All right, that's the rule. Okay, let's keep going. We've got some capital letters here. Let's see what this is gonna tell us. The parties agree that a real estate brokerage firm acting as an escrow agent may place the earnest money deposit in an interest bearing trust account. And that any interest earned thereon shall be dispersed to the escrow agent monthly in consideration of the expenses incurred by maintaining such account and records associated therewith. So there you go. So the, um, the trust account can be interest bearing. And in this document, all the parties are agreeing to, to that situation. We're saying, okay. I only had one buyer in my whole life that asked me that and said, is this an interest-bearing trust account? I said, let me check. <laughs> and it was. All right, here we go. The definition of effective contract date. What does it mean to actually hit the contract date? This is a really important situation because there are a few deadlines in here that are time sensitive. So it's important that all the agents are on board in terms of when we've hit effective contract date. So here's the definition. Effective date is the date that, number one, the last one of buyer and seller has signed or initialed this offer or the final counter offer, if any. And two, such signing or initialing is communicated to the party making the offer or counter offer as the case may be. 
the parties acknowledge and agree that the initial lines at the bottom of each page of this contract are merely evidence of their having reviewed the terms of each page and that the complete execution of such initial lines shall not be a condition of the effectiveness of this agreement, which I mentioned earlier. So let's focus on the effective date. So the effective date is either one of two things. When the last one of buyer and seller has signed or initialed this offer or final counter offer, if any, and two, such signing or initialing is communicated to the party making the offer or counter offer as the case may be. That communication can happen any number of ways. And remember, if it's communicated via email, it's considered delivered when it hits the server, not when the agent opens the email. All right, we're getting to some important stuff. So we're gonna slow down a little bit here. And we're gonna talk about what the world is due diligence. Now you're gonna to wanna to get a good grasp on this because a lot of our out of state buyers and in the future sellers will not be familiar with a due diligence period. So let's check it out so we really get a firm grasp on it. Due diligence is defined as the following. The buyer's opportunity to investigate the property and the transaction contemplated by this contract, including but not necessarily limited to the matters described in paragraph four below. We're going to line out some of the things the buyer is going to want to inspect in order to make their decision. To decide whether buyer in buyer's sole discretion will proceed with or terminate the transaction. Okay. Now, what we're all curious about is the money. What is a due diligence fee? What's up with that? So let's read it. The due diligence fee is defined as a negotiated amount, if any, paid by buyer to seller with this contract for buyer's right to terminate the contract for what? For any reason or no reason during the due diligence period. It shall be the property of seller upon the effective date and shall be a credit to the buyer at closing and a debit to the seller. The due diligence fee shall be non-refundable. So the buyer's not gonna get it back period, unless, so here's the except. The due diligence fee shall be non-refundable except in the event of a material breach of this contract by seller, or if this contract is terminated under paragraph 8N or as otherwise provided in any addendum hereto, buyer and seller each expressly waive any right that they may have to deny the right to conduct due diligence or to assert any defense as to the enforceability of this contract based on the absence or alleged insufficiency of any due diligence fee, it being the intent of the parties to create a legally binding contract for the purchase and sale of the property without regard to the existence or amount of any due diligence fee. And again, it references paragraph 23, um, breach of contract remedies. All right, so let's slow down and look at this top part again. The due diligence fee is a negotiated amount, so it's always gonna be different, there's no standard. And it says, if any, so it could be zero, paid by the buyer to the seller with this contract for the buyer's right to do what? To terminate the contract for any reason, any reason or no reason at all. Mm -hmm. Do you think sellers feel very confident in that? No. So do you think sellers enjoy a robust amount of due diligence money? Absolutely. If they can get it. And in this market, they're getting it for sure. So Kelly, are you trying to tell me that a buyer could back out of this contract because their dog looked at them funny one morning? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Are you trying to tell me, Kelly, that a buyer could back out of this contract because the, um, the astrologer told him it was not a good time to purchase this home? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying to you. Are you trying to tell me, Kelly, that a buyer could back out of this contract because they just don't feel like going forward with it? Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. What does the buyer lose? The buyer loses the due diligence money. The seller keeps it. 
the buyer will get back the earnest money deposit. Write that down. If the buyer backs out during the due diligence period, they relinquish the due diligence fee, they will get back the earnest money deposit. Of course, there needs to be written notice, FYI. All right, let's keep going. Let's talk about what is the due diligence period. The due diligence period is the period beginning on the effective date of this contract and extending through 5 p.m. on blank date. And that is also negotiable. So you really want enough time if you're representing the buyer to make sure that the loan, if the buyer is getting a loan, that it has enough time to make it through underwriting and hit final approval. This can take three to four weeks. Now, sellers are impatient. So it's this push and pull between what the buyer needs, what the seller is willing to do, accommodate those sorts of things. But be aware if you're representing the buyer, you need enough time to um, get that loan all the way through underwriting and finally approved because there is no extra contingency in this contract form for loans. It says time being of the essence, and that is gonna be addressed coming up here in a page or two under information regarding the buyer. It's a big deal. It's a hard deadline. So what does that mean? Let's say that um, two days after this date, the buyer decides that they wanna back out of the contract. Well, now they're in breach of contract. So they can't just easily back out once you go past this hard deadline. There are consequences. We'll put it to you that way. And we'll get to those momentarily. All right, letter K is a definition of what is a settlement. A lot of us call the settlement meeting the closing, which technically is fairly incorrect, but it's what we do. So let's talk about the settlement. The settlement is defined as the proper execution and delivery to the closing attorney of all documents necessary to complete the transaction contemplated by this contract, including the deed, the settlement statement, which is now, well, if it's a cash closing, it's another story, but if you're getting a home loan, it's going to be called the closing disclosure. All right, so including the deed, the settlement statement, the deed of trust, and other loan or conveyance documents, and the closing attorney's receipt of all funds necessary to complete the transaction, including whoever is the escrow agent, they've got to come to closing to the settlement meeting with that earnest money deposit check. So we've got to get that money out of the escrow account. So the settlement really is the gathering of everybody and all of the materials getting together, ready to sign all of our documents. Settlement date. The settlement date is defined as the parties agree that settlement will take place on blank date unless otherwise agreed in writing at a time and place designated by the buyer. So the buyer gets to decide where the settlement meeting is going to take place and the buyer hires the closing attorney just in case you get that test question. All right, well, we are just blazing right through this material, already on page two, moving along to page three. We're just like a speeding bullet train. All right, let's go. This is important stuff though on page two. All right, we're gonna look at uh, delay in settlement for conditions under which settlement may be delayed. That's coming up. There's an, uh, an adjusted rule about that. But first, we are going to define what the closing is. All right, here we go. Closing is defined as the completion of the legal process, which results in the transfer of title, that means transfer of ownership, to the property from seller to buyer, which includes the following steps. Let's read them. Step one, the settlement as defined above. Step two, the completion of a satisfactory title update to the property following the settlement. That's where the attorney takes one last look to see if there were any liens or anything like that that 
um, will affect the transfer of title that came in at the last minute. All right, and number three, the closing attorney's receipt of authorization to disperse all necessary funds. Number four, recordation in the appropriate county registry of the deed and deed of trust, if any. Remember the deed of trust is what we call a mortgage essentially here in North Carolina, uh, if any, which shall take place as soon as reasonably possible for the closing attorney after the settlement, meaning the settlement meeting. Upon closing, the proceeds of sale shall be dispersed by the closing attorney in accordance with the settlement statement and the provisions of Chapter 45A of the North Carolina General Statutes. That's the rule about good funds, the Good Funds Act. If the title update should reveal unexpected liens, okay, so this is where the attorney's taken one last final look. What happens if they find something? So let's see. If the title update should reveal unexpected liens, encumbrances, or other title defects, or if the closing attorney is not authorized to disperse all necessary funds, then the closing shall be suspended and the settlement deemed delayed under paragraph 12, coming up here shortly. Okay, yikes, we gotta fix that if we find something. All right, this warning box in red tells us essentially that we need a closing attorney to handle the settlement services, but let's read the actual language. Warning, the North Carolina State Bar has determined that the performance of most acts and services required for a closing constitutes the practice of law and must be performed only by an attorney licensed to practice law in North Carolina. State law prohibits unlicensed individuals or firms from rendering legal services or device. Although non-attorney settlement agents may perform limited services in connection with a closing, they may not perform all the acts and services required to complete a closing. And we'll talk about that in a second. A closing involves significantly legal issues that should be handled by an attorney. Accordingly, it is the position of the North Carolina Bar Association and the North Carolina Association of Realtors that all buyers should hire an attorney licensed in North Carolina to perform a closing. Very good. Now, there are instances where the seller may have their documents um, prepared, shall we say, by the attorney, and then the seller may have a quick meeting with a paralegal to sign those documents, like the deed and so forth, um, when we finally get to the settlement meeting. That is A-OK -okay unless the seller has questions or needs things to be explained. So the paralegal will not be authorized to answer questions like that or advise in any way. So the seller can come in and simply sign some of their very simple documents to transfer title, but if the seller has questions or needs advice, then the attorney will need to come down or come over from their office and, and handle that. But the closing is much more complex for the, the buyer. So definitely the buyer needs to hire an attorney to handle that. In other states, the uh, title company will, will conduct the closing, but we use attorneys here. All right, let's talk about special assessments. Special assessments fall right in line, if there is one, with your annual property tax bill. So let's read what special assessments states under letter N. Special assessments are defined as a charge against the property by a governmental authority in addition to ad valorem taxes, means your property taxes, ad valorem means according to value, and record and recurring governmental service fees levied with such taxes or by an owner's association in addition to any regular assessment dues, either of which may be a lien against the property. And a lien is a monetary non-possessory charge against the property um, where the property is providing security for a debt. And it attaches to the property, not the per person. All right, and we're going to address how those are handled coming up here shortly in paragraphs six and eight.
Okay, fixtures and exclusions. I love this warning, look at this. Warning, the parties should not assume that an item will or will not be included in the sale based on an oral or written statement or understanding that is not part of this contract. Buyer and seller should be specific when negotiating what items will be included or excluded from the sale. Clarity's power, y'all. Okay, and then it tells us here that fixtures are included in the purchase price. Very good. And we're gonna go down now. We're moving on to page four and we're gonna look over what are the fixtures in North Carolina that automatically transfer with the sale of the property unless, unless the seller says these items do not convey. All right, let's see here. Um, it says, buyer and seller agree that the following items, if present on the property on the date of the offer shall be included in the sale as part of the purchase price free of liens, unless excluded in sub paragraphs D or E below. Free of liens, meaning there should not be a UCC one filed against any of these items, just so you know. Okay, all items listed below include both traditional and smart versions and any exclusive, exclusively dedicated related equipment and or remote control devices. Now that got added in. And I think it's because if you look over here at invisible fencing, like invisible pet fencing, well, we know that due to adaptability, okay, right? So if we did, if we went to go see Judge Judy and there was a, a dispute over all the parts and pieces that are associated with invisible fencing, the Judge Judy using the total circumstances test would say, huh, well, where's, where is the dog collar? Where's the remote control? Well, I've, I've heard the dog collars could be like 500 or thousand dollars. Well, the seller might say, I'm not leaving the dog collars. Judge Judy's gonna say, oh, really? Cause yes, you are. The dog collar is specially designed to fit with this system, this invisible, in, invisible fencing system. Same with the remote control. So I'm willing to bet you there have been some arguments over some system related parts and pieces, which would uh, explain the addition of this strong language all in caps. Again, saying that the items listed below will include any dedicated related equipment and or remote control devices. So you just wanna take a cursory glance over all of those items. Do note that the same list does exist in the listing agreement. So when you take a listing, you will, be go, be, you will go over this list with your seller as well. And the seller will decide at that time, is there anything on this list they don't want to sell with the property? And that would go here under letter E items that do not convey. So if the homeowner really wanted to keep those dog collars, it would, they would list that item in under letter E. Now I, I skipped letter D on purpose. Okay, so items that are leased or not owned, which might include fuel tanks, antenna, satellite dishes, receivers, appliances, so on and so forth, will be listed in that area as well. And then it says here, which I love, seller shall repair any damage caused by removal of any items excluded above. So for instance, if the seller wants to take the TV mounting brackets, those are supposed to transfer with the property. But if they wanna take the brackets with them, um, that's gonna leave a lot of damage to the drywall. So the seller is responsible for fixing that just like new. All right, when we get back together for our next session, we're gonna pick up on page five of 15 and we're gonna keep it rolling. So go ahead and take a break right now and come back and see me for the next part of the North Carolina Standard Form Offer to Purchase Form 2T. See you shortly.